Welcome to our Gabelli School Centennial Speaker Series webinar. Thank you for joining us for today's event, featuring Professor Campbell D. Harvey discussing DeFi and the future of finance. My name is Sri Strategy, Professor of Finance and Business Economics at the Gabelli School and Gabelli Chair in Global Security Analysis. And it's my pleasure to be here on behalf of the Gabelli School. The Gabelli School Centennial Virtual Speaker Series began in 2020, marking 100 years of purpose-driven business education at Fordham. In the last year, the Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis and our wonderful partners, the Museum of American Finance and CFA Society in New York have sponsored more than 30 events that drew nearly 5,000 attendees. We are tremendously proud of this dynamic partnership and a full archive of our video content will be shared in the thank you email you will receive. Today's session features Professor Campbell Harvey, who is the J. Paul Stick Professor of International Business and Professor of Finance at the Fukuoka School of Business, Duke University, and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Professor Harvey is an internationally renowned scholar and a thought leader whose accomplishments and achievements will require many pages to list. For the sake of time, I'll cite only a few. He's a fellow of the American Finance Association and served as the president of the American Finance Association in 2016. The American Finance Association is the most renowned international organization of academics in finance, and his flagship publication is the Journal of Finance. Professor Harvey was the editor of the Journal of Finance from 2006 to 2012. He received many awards, including multiple best paper awards from the Journal of Portfolio Management and eight Graham and Dodd awards from the CFA Institute for excellence in financial writing. He has published over 150 scholarly articles on topics spanning investment, emerging markets, corporate finance, behavioral finance, financial econometrics, and computer science. Professor Harvey is the founding director of the Duke CFO survey. This widely watched quarterly survey polls over 1,500 CFOs worldwide. Over the past seven years, Professor Harvey has taught innovation and crypto ventures at Duke University. The course focuses on blockchain technology and decentralized finance. He also teaches tech-driven transformation of business and international finance. He also offers a course called Blockchain Business Models. Today, Professor Harvey will deliver a presentation for about 45 minutes at which point my colleague, Professor Anyan and I will field questions submitted through the Q&A section near the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please feel free to submit questions at any point during our event. We will be addressing as many of them as possible during the session. I also want to share that e electronic copies of DeFi and Future of Finance will be given to all attendees where permissible. Before I turn it over to Professor Harvey, I want to warmly ask that you consider making a donation to the Gabelli School Centennial Fund. You can make a tax exempt gift quickly and securely online at the links provided in the chat. Now, without further ado, I turn it over to Professor Campbell D. Harvey. Thank you uh, very much. Um, let me talk today about something that I've been working on for the past seven years. So this is something that I invested some time in after I retired uh, as editor of the Journal of Finance. I was revising my courses. I didn't teach for seven years uh, as a result of the editorial appointment. And I decided to add into the foreign currency part of my course, something on cryptocurrency. And then I went down the rabbit hole. So this uh, presentation 
we'll talk about some of the opportunities that DeFi uh, presents, and it will also detail uh, some of the risks. And I look forward to questions at the end. Uh, the presentation deck also will be uh, available afterwards. So, so let's kind of motivate uh, the situation that we're facing. Um, Bitcoin was new many years ago. Um, it seems a lot better known today. Uh, indeed, the CEO of the largest uh, bank in the world uh, said that Bitcoin was a fraud. Uh, indeed, he also said that he would fire any employee trading Bitcoin for being stupid. But times have changed. JP Morgan joins the Bitcoin bandwagon. And uh, of course, this summer we saw the IPO of the most successful firm in the crypto space, uh, Coinbase. Uh, got an $85 billion valuation in its uh, debut. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a company that is a centralized uh, company. So I want to distinguish between a decentralized exchange and a centralized exchange. Uh, they are a centralized exchange, but they deal in a decentralized product, but very successful. Indeed, uh, Duke University was an early investor, given that the co-founder of Coinbase uh, is a Duke uh, graduate and the picture of my students, of course, uh, below. So, so basically, in my opinion, too much attention is paid to Bitcoin and its price fluctuations, or Elon Musk's uh, tweets about Dogecoin. So that's what gets the media attention, but there's something else. Uh, and I say it's largely under the radar and it, is different than Bitcoin um, because Bitcoin, there's a very limited number of things you can actually do with that. And this is decentralized finance. And this is um, the first slide from my course. And, and you can see that many of the words here are words that you know already, like mint, invariant, fork, gas, vault, digest, all of these words have very special meaning in decentralized finance. Uh, and indeed, it makes it a nightmare to do a translation of this book uh, because literal uh, just doesn't uh, work. So by the end of my course, my students have an understanding of each of these terms. So uh, what is DeFi? And this is my book on, on the right. So, so DeFi, in the simplest possible way to think about it, is trading as a peer with an algorithm. So think of the algorithm as something that just exists out there. Uh, you've got asset one, you want to buy asset two, and you want to use asset one to do that exchange. So you send asset one to the algorithm, the algorithm sends you asset two. The algorithm is completely open source. You can see it, you can see the liquidity in the algorithm, and you've got a very good idea of the price that you're gonna get. That algorithm is owned by nobody. It's just out there in a blockchain. Okay, so, so this idea of trading with an algorithm is not really that far-fetched given that it is reasonable to expect that we will be dealing with algorithms in many different industries, not just uh, finance. This algorithm is called a smart contract in, uh, in the terminology of decentralized finance. The algorithm doesn't care if you're a buyer or a seller. The algorithm operates 24 seven. Uh, and as I said, it's completely open. It doesn't matter if you are uh, a small player in the market, or a large player. There's no distinction between, let's say, the client, the retail investor, the institutional investor, the banker, and all this stuff is irrelevant. Everybody is treated uh, equally. So, so this is essentially decentralized finance. It's more, of course. So I've talked about exchange. It also has to do with savings and lending. Uh, and I will talk a little bit at the end about the idea of tokenization.
So this is a technology that fundamentally threatens uh, much of the existing infrastructure in terms of our commercial banks, in terms of our exchanges, our brokers, our insurance companies, all of them have a giant bullseye painted on, uh, on their, their logo. So um, let's uh, kind of jump into it. And with any new technology, it is essential that it solves problems that exist today. I'm not that impressed if somebody pitches an idea to me that solves a problem that doesn't yet exist. The problems that we'll talk about today exist. And these are some of them. So inefficiency, this I feature in my book is, um, is one of the first uh, wire transfers, Western Union. Uh, it's for $300. And what I want you to notice is not the $300 that was transferred in 1873, but the cost. Notice the cost is $9. So 3% fee. And essentially I motivate this saying that nothing has changed in 150 years. So it's kind of interesting that uh, the internet and social media really jumped on this example and said it was false. It wasn't true that the cost is not $9 to do that $300 a transfer. So you can actually go online and actually try to do a transfer. And here it is. And notice the fee is enormous. So the fee is actually $47 uh, to do it today. So you could argue that the situation is worse today than it was in 1873. And of course, in 1873, the cash might arrive by, uh, by horse. <laughs> so so this, is, uh, this is very um, remarkable. So inefficiency, there's no reason to have a 300 basis point swipe fee for a credit card. There's no reason that we have to uh, have such a delay between buying a stock and actually owning the stock, which is like two days. So in decentralized finance, um, everybody is trading with peers. There's no difference between settlement and execution. It happens at the same time. And we can constantly improve. So limited access is the second problem. And it's well known that 1.7 billion people are unbanked in the world. Uh, but it's less well known that, uh, and the numbers are not tabulated, but I suspect that more than 1.7 billion are underbanked. And, and what do I mean by this? Suppose an entrepreneur has got a great idea and the idea could generate 25% return on investment. They've got a banking relationship. They go to the bank, pitch the idea and ask for a loan. And the banker says, well, I, I really love your idea, but... I prefer to deal with a larger company rather than 100 uh, people like you. But given that you are associated and have a banking relationship with us, I will bump the credit limit on your credit card so you can use that to finance the idea. But we all know what that interest rate is, and that interest rate could be more than 20%. So as a result, the project is not undertaken. And that's the kind of project we really need in our economy to kind of jolt us out of this lethargic two or maybe 3% real growth in GDP. So decentralized finance has got lots of possibilities here um, in terms of savings and lending to earn uh, like a, an actual return on your savings deposit is possible in this uh, framework. So opacity is another uh, issue today. So um, I feature here a letter that was written um, by uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, to the Treasury Secretary. And it's interesting because she refers to DeFi uh, as a fast growing and highly opaque corner of the cryptocurrency market. And this demonstrates that uh, either Elizabeth Warren or the person that wrote the letter for her fundamentally does not understand uh, decentralized finance. Uh, in decentralized finance, everything is open source. You see everything, 
in that contract, that smart contract, it is open source. You see the liquidity, you see the balances of the counterparties. Uh, it, is, it is completely transparent. What is opaque is our current system where you do business with the bank and you have no idea how healthy that bank is. You rely upon our regulators to monitor that bank, but the regulators have a history that is dubious uh, at best. A centralized control is the uh, fourth issue. And what I'm really talking about here is the concentration of our financial system. So our banking system is highly concentrated in the US. It's even more concentrated in other countries like Canada and the UK. Uh, and when you've got that centralized control, it means that you've got market power. So you resist change, you keep fees as high as possible, um, and, and you try to block entry of competitors. So this new technology of DeFi is totally different. There's no, there's no market power. It is financial democracy. It is about inclusion. So the last one is lack of interoperability. And this is important um, because if you've ever tried to uh, send money to a broker to set up an account, it's gonna take two to five days or vice versa to get money from your broker, you sold some stock to get back into your bank account. Same thing, okay, it's completely unacceptable to me. Uh, in this day and age of the internet, that it takes two to five days to move uh, money in a simple transaction. In decentralized finance, there's nothing like that. So if there is uh, money to move, if I want to trade on a decentralized exchange, I literally just plug my wallet in. I'm ready to go within a couple of minutes. So uh, this is the idea of DeFi Legos, where all of the DeFi protocols uh, connect with each other. And that's fundamentally different than the system that we've got uh, today. So there's many problems that can be solved, but there's also many risks that are uh, important in the system. So any balanced analysis of decentralized finance needs to look at the risks as well as the opportunities. And let me talk about some of these risks. So uh, number one, is smart contract risk. So this is really interesting because I classify it as a new attack vector. And what do I mean by that? Think about uh, people uh, trying to hack into, let's say Target, um, which was hacked uh, three years ago. It's enormously difficult to penetrate the system. And once the hacker actually gets in, then the hacker has to figure out where to go. And there could be potentially millions of lines of code. So in decentralized finance, everything is open source. You see all of the code. And that means that multiple people could be looking at this code, trying to figure out a way uh, to exploit it. So this is why I call this a new attack vector. And uh, it's sometimes called smart contract risk. Indeed, there are many companies that specialize in auditing uh, these smart contracts. And indeed, some protocols will employ more than one company to try to find weaknesses in the actual code. The code needs to be rock solid. Uh, indeed, there are many different types of errors. So one error is a simple error, like a logic error, where you do some rounding, for instance. Or another error might be a more subtle economic exploit, um, where where basically uh, an attacker can go and take advantage of uh, certain weaknesses on various different uh, platforms. So the logic error, again, is simple. Um, suppose that the code says to pay out 14 ether, but the, uh, but the actual smart contract has only got 13.9999. Well, even though the difference between 14 and the 13.999 might be only uh, less than a cent, the transaction fails. So it's gotta be exact. So this is a really basic uh, logic error. Um, but to me, the economic exploits are much more uh, interesting. So for example, it could be that uh, the contract uh, is using information from another exchange. 
And this is uh, using a so-called Oracle. So some information outside of the blockchain. And it might be if that exchange is illiquid, an exploiter could actually uh, do a large transaction on the illiquid exchange to manipulate the price feed and then take that manipulated price feed goes back to the main contract and then the exploiter can profit uh, from that. So there's many different types of risk uh, that actually arise from this. So let me talk about uh, an example here and it's an example of a flash attack. So this is interesting. I'm not going to call this a hack as you will see this is, uh, this is, I think, better called an exploit. So the example is Yearn.Finance. It actually happened during my course uh, in February of 2021. And let me describe uh, what actually happened here. So this attack uses a flash loan. And a flash loan is one of the most fascinating concepts in decentralized finance. A flash loan is something that uh, it's a loan that you don't need any collateral for. There's no counterparty risk. There's no duration to the loan. And, uh, and, and, and basically, uh, there's no interest rate on the loan. So, so this is quite a remarkable uh, innovation. And the way that it actually works is fundamental to how Ethereum smart contracts work. So think of this transaction as having uh, four different steps. In the actual exploit, there are many more steps, but let's consider uh, a very simple step. So uh, the first step is to borrow some money. And the second step is, let's say it's an arbitrage, so you use that money to buy a token on one exchange that you deem as cheap. And then the third step, you sell that token on another exchange at a higher price. The fourth step is you send the profit back to yourself. And then the fifth step is you repay the loan and you're done. But the key thing with uh, a transaction in Ethereum is that if any step fails, you revert to where you began with. So if it was the case that the arbitrage didn't work out, you didn't have enough money to pay back the loan, then basically the transaction fails, you go back to the state before the loan. So in that sense, the loan is risk-free, no counterparty risk, it's zero duration and, and quite remarkable. The other thing is, if you think about a $200 million loan uh, that's uncollateralized, maybe and maybe a very large hedge fund could pull something off like this, maybe. But in this space, anybody can do it. So this could be your 15-year-old daughter sees a possible arbitrage and does a $200 million flash loan like uh, in this exploit and, and profits from it. So this is available, doesn't matter who you are. And as I said, this is about financial uh, democracy. There's another exploit. Um, uh, that's uh, kind of interesting. And this is the Poly uh, Network where it was drained of 611 million. And it was basically uh, quote unquote, the largest fraud uh, in decentralized finance uh, history. And uh, I should put quotes around fraud and you'll see why. So uh, somebody drained the actual 600 million, uh, but then there was a conversation between the people that were drained and, and the hacker or the exploiter. And it's really easy to do that because we know the address of the uh, exploiter. So you just send a small amount of coin to them with the message. And, and let me kind of go through this. It's very interesting. Um, they're saying, well, why are you doing this? And the person says, well, for fun. Um, and then basically a more detailed explanation is the following. So like I spotted a bug. And I had mixed feelings. What, what should I do? So what would you do when you're facing such a fortune? So one possibility is to ask the project team politely so that they uh, can fix it. But 
anyone on the project team could be a traitor, given that 1 billion is at stake. And th this 1 billion, I guess, is 611 million rounded up uh, to 1 billion. I can trust nobody. The only solution I can come up with is saving it in a trusted account while keeping myself anonymous. So basically, you see the exploit. The person says, well, if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. And it turns out that this person actually refunded uh, the money to the protocol uh, and, and actually got what's known as a bug bounty of $500,000. I might have negotiated for a higher bug bounty, but you see uh, the possibilities here. This is just risk. This is a new space and this is possible. This exploiter gave the money back, but there's been many situations where the money has not gone back. Uh, so I will say uh, that not all smart contracts are smart. Indeed, almost any financial product that uses the word smart um, as a prefix, I'm suspicious about. So um, number two risk is governance risk. And again, this is a, a new world of governance where a protocol is controlled often by a governance a token. Um, in this space, there's often two different types of smart contracts. So one might be a contract that's de uh, deployed like a, a Uniswap uh, version two contract that is basically set in stone. So you can't change it. Once it's deployed, it's there forever. People might use it, people might not use it, but it is there, it exists forever. You can't delete it. And that's key with blockchain technology. Once it's there, it's always there. But there's other protocols that allow for some parameters uh, to be adjusted by the governance. And that might be the interest rate that's paid. Uh, it might be something to do with uh, minting of tokens or burning of tokens, many different levers that the governance actually votes on. And often what happens is when a new protocol is launched, the developers retain control of governance for a while. And uh, this is so they can fix uh, certain uh, parameters or, or code and things like that. Uh, but often um, they realize, well, this isn't really uh, decentralized until we actually give the governance to the community. And indeed, uh, this happens. When this happens, this poses some risk. So this is an interesting uh, exploit that happened in March. And this is a, a stable coin called True Seniorage Dollar. And at the point of this exploit, the uh, developers had only 9% of the governance. So the hacker actually went and bought uh, enough of the governance token to get control of the protocol. And the hacker vote puts a, a motion forward to the governance to mint him or herself 11.5 quintillion of these uh, TSDs. And that went through because the hacker had uh, the governance votes and then the hacker dumped 11.8 billion on a decentralized exchange and drove the value uh, to zero. So uh, the people at True Senior Age Dollar basically said, look, um, that's sad, uh, it's an attack, but this is how a decentralized protocol actually works. So this is just a risk and people will learn from it. So Oracle risk is number three. And, um, and we've kind of talked about uh, the Oracle uh, before. Oracle means that you're gathering information outside a blockchain. And that information is subject to manipulation and, uh, and the Oracle is really essential. So uh, this provides uh, another risk vector. And indeed, there are many uh, companies that specialize in oracles. And, um, and indeed, if you think about a decentralized exchange that uses an oracle, um, a, a simple problem would be the oracle going down. If the oracle goes down, then there's just no information that uh, can be used to run the actual uh, protocol. So I refer to this as a crippling uh, outage. So Oracle risk is important uh, in this space. So number four is scaling risk. And uh, Ethereum as well as Bitcoin uses this really computationally 
uh, expensive um, and burdensome technology called uh, proof of work. And uh, Bitcoin can only process transactions once every 10 minutes. Ethereum's a lot faster every 15 seconds, but nevertheless, it's slowed by this really burdensome uh, computational exercise that the miners do to both secure the blockchain and verify uh, transactions. So uh, the risk here is that if you think about um, Visa, they can do 65,000 transactions per second, whereas Ethereum can only do 15. So how can this be uh, the new world of finance if you can only do 15 transactions per second? And what's really important here is to assess, well, is this risk the type of risk that can be mitigated? And uh, for Ethereum, it is definitely the case that this can be mitigated. So um, there are various initiatives underway to bring the amount of transactions per second much closer to what we see uh, for deleting uh, protocols uh, such as Visa, MasterCard, uh, and things like that. So the first thing is that Ethereum will move to a different technology, which is called proof of stake. And this is not computationally expensive to do. Uh, it is uh, very efficient. And that means that you can do many more transactions per second. Indeed, this alone could be uh, enough to guarantee 50,000 uh, transactions per second. But there's more. Uh, Ethereum, the next version of Ethereum, uh, promises to do um, a type of scaling called horizontal scaling. So vertical scaling, in contrast, is basically instead of having thousands of computers uh, doing your verification, you have a small number. Uh, it could be one or it could be a handful, uh, like Algorand has got a handful. But what Ethereum is doing is horizontal scale, scaling, which is sometimes called sharding. And think of this as having, instead of one chain, you've got 64 uh, different chains that are connected with a master chain. And again, this, uh, this alone uh, could deliver uh, 50,000 transactions per second. There's also the possibility of layer two. And layer two is a technology that you use an on-chain transaction to seed uh, a channel. And then within this channel, which is highly secure, you can do as many transactions as you want instantly at uh, essentially zero cost. Uh, indeed, layer two is somewhat in the news because when El Salvador uh, adopted uh, Bitcoin uh, as an experiment, they, it wasn't feasible to use the Bitcoin blockchain because the cost of transacting is too high. It's about $19 a transaction. And if you can imagine buying a cup of coffee and then having a transaction fee of $19, no. So they use a layer two on the Bitcoin blockchain uh, to allow for near zero cost of transactions. So, so this is another idea that could greatly allow for scaling. So, so basically uh, scaling to me is something that's relevant today but it's not going to be relevant uh, in the future. The technology is there to allow for um, fairly extreme uh, scaling. Uh, however, for me, 65,000 transactions a second is just not good enough. Um, so I believe in a future where we need millions, if not billions of transactions per second uh, capability. So um, the fifth risk is DEX risk. So DEX is decentralized exchange. And I've talked a little bit about DEX um, and there's two different types of DEX. There's one that's fully and completely automated, just an algorithm called an automated uh, market maker. There's also uh, order book exchanges. Both are different, both have strengths and weaknesses. Um, the uh, automated market makers, there's an opportunity cost to actually using them. All of this is really new stuff. And uh, there are risks that involve um, decentralized exchange. Uh, the sixth risk is custodial risk. So with this technology, you need to actually keep your private key. And private key is just a random number. It's 256 bits of data. So if you lose your private key, then you lose your cryptocurrency. Okay, so, so this is quite serious. 
and and you need to find a, a solution. So one solution would be a self uh, custody. So you might just write down the uh, your private key somewhere or put it on a USB stick and keep it off your computer. Um, or you might do something different uh, where you use a custodial uh, service like Coinbase, your broker, just like your broker today uh, holds your stocks in their name, not your name. The broker can hold your private key in their name. So there's many solutions out here, but the risk is substantial. And I'm sure some of you saw this uh, New York Times article. This is uh, a developer in California that decided to do self-custody. They put all their private keys on a hardware wallet that's password protected. So they got many private keys. It's in this very secure location, not connected to the internet. And uh, the password is basically the way in to retrieve the private keys. But the developer forgot the password. And, and this uh, basically, the hardware wallet has got the system whereby if you miss 10 times in a row the password, then the data in the hardware wallet is destroyed. It self destructs. And this uh, developer, has basically tried eight times to uh, guess the password and eight failures. It has two more tries and the coin in the hardware wallet is worth $220 million. So uh, supposedly he's cool with that, but I seriously doubt it. Okay, so uh, what do you do here? Again, there's custodial services where you can actually uh, let somebody else uh, watch your key. There's also um, splitting of keys. So you split the key into three parts, you keep two. A custodial uh, company will keep the, the, uh, the other third and you reconstitute the key with two out of three. So if the custodial firm is hacked, no big deal. Nobody can do anything with their one third. Um, and uh, if you lose your mobile phone, you lose one third, no big deal. You put the custodial firm's third and the third on your laptop uh, together and you can recover everything. So, so this is again, uh, something It's a cost of using this technology, but it is definitely a risk. Uh, there's also environmental risk, and, and this is uh, important because in the news we hear things like, oh, well, Bitcoin's energy use is the same as the, uh, the country of Argentina. And it is very substantial uh, energy use, but I do think that we need to put this in perspective that the proof of work that got Bitcoin and Ethereum started is both the greatest strength and the greatest weakness. So the strength is that the computational power is so enormous that it's infeasible to go back in history and change the record of transactions in their blockchains. So there's no hacker that can do this. Indeed, there's no country that could amass the computing power to actually do this. So it is a record set in stone that cannot be changed. So that's the strength, but the weakness is twofold. So one, I've already mentioned that this actually is slow and it reduces the number of transactions per second to maybe 15, and we don't want that. Uh, so it's slow, but it's also environmentally reckless. So China has banned all mining within their country. Some still goes on illegally, but, and that's a good thing because much of the electricity for that was being used um, or being generated by, by coal. So, uh, so I think that the proof of work uh, is essentially causing this energy issue. It's not positively contributing to climate change. For decentralized finance, it's not really that big of a deal because uh, Ethereum is changing from proof of work to proof of stake which is much more energy efficient. Indeed, there are many other protocols in decentralized finance that use not the Ethereum blockchain, 
but Ethereum similar blockchains. So you can do smart contracting and things like that. And they're already using proof of stake. And they're already getting the 50,000 transactions per second. So just a matter of time before in decentralized finance, the environmental risk is mitigated. So for Bitcoin, and this talk is not really about Bitcoin, uh, they're not going to change. And I've actually calculated that the marginal cost uh, in terms of carbon offset for a new Bitcoin is about $4,000. So it's very, very substantial uh, cost to offset. So, so I do think, uh, again, uh, Ethereum will likely transition to the proof of stake late in 2022 or early in 2023. And uh, I don't think there's any uncertainty uh, about that. Uh, of course, there are uh, products out there where you can actually buy into an ETF and automatically uh, there's a carbon offset that is triggered. So people are thinking about mitigating this risk. Uh, regulatory is a big deal. And we all know that decentralized finance is in the crosshairs of the SEC right now. Um, China has banned crypto transactions. Uh, there is no regulatory guidance here right now. And indeed, uh, if you think about it, uh, the Securities Act of 1933 didn't really mention uh, anything about cryptocurrency. Uh, that was obviously not invented at the time. So it's really wide open right now. So I do think in talking to the regulators that they understand the balancing act. So uh, the balancing act is the following, that uh, the Securities Act of 1933 was designed to protect uh, investors from the abuses that happened in the late 1920s that eventually led to the Great Depression. Uh, so you wanna protect uh, investors, you don't want them exploited, but you also don't want to be too harsh because if you're too harsh, then you will drive the innovations offshore. And in this space, it's really easy to drive the innovation offshore. You can just set up anywhere in the world. And we actually want these innovative ideas to stay in our country. So it is a, a difficult task for the regulators because this is a complex technology. Uh, you need to invest time to understand it. And even when you invest the time, it's changing so rapidly. They have to continually uh, invest time. And indeed, uh, it's really hard for them to attract uh, people to work for them that understand this technology because uh, these people have other opportunities. So let me conclude before uh, the questions and we're going to have a good 15 minutes uh, for questions. And I see a number of them have already come in on the Q&A. So uh, let me just reflect on our situation. So we have been operating, in my opinion, with the same model for over a century. The same commercial banks, some of them have merged, but names are likely the same. Stock exchanges, brokerages, insurance companies. It's essentially the same system. Uh, and of course, the central banks are the same. And the current wave of fintech that gets a lot of play um, is basically improving on centralized finance. And I argue that the current wave of fintech is likely fleeting. Indeed, one of the speakers in my course uh, made the following uh, statement. Um, the current fintech like Stripe and Plaid is like putting lipstick on a pig. And, and what uh, the speaker meant was that these fintech make the process more efficient, which is good, but they're using the infrastructure of the centralized financial system. And as such, there's a limit to what they can actually do in terms of the savings, in terms of transactions costs. So essentially the view here is, well, these are good ideas and they are good for consumers in reducing costs, that they are fleeting and they will be replaced by decentralized uh, protocols. And indeed, it's remarkable to me, we're less than 1% into this disruption, yet 
the size of the crypto complex right now rivals the global capitalization of all commercial banks. So even though we're 1% in, uh, this space is something that you cannot uh, ignore. And let me quote uh, something from uh, Tim Roughgarden, who's a computer scientist at Columbia and very well known. Uh, and this is from his opening lecture. And, and I think it's important um, to read this. Future generations will be jealous of your opportunity to get in on the ground floor in this new area. So this is an opportunity that is, in my opinion, once in a generation or once in, once in multiple generations. So this is early on, not late. There is risk, obviously, but there is a lot of potential. So in the book, I basically say that I see the scaffolding of a new city and this scaffolding, to be clear, is a reinvention of finance. This is not a renovation of our current system. The current wave of fintech is a renovation. This is a complete rebuild from the bottom up. And indeed, I start the book with the sentence, we have come full circle. So what I mean by that is the very first market exchange was barter and barter was super inefficient. You had to exactly match the buyer and the sellers. Well, today with tokenization, we can have in our wallet, multiple different tokens representing different things. And indeed, this allows us to return to barter, but a very efficient barter. I gave a talk yesterday where I said that money as we know it has changed. Given that you have the possibility of having tokens in your wallet that might represent US dollars, but might represent gold, might represent a share of stock like Apple, many different things are possible in your wallet. And indeed, given that the definition of money has changed, that things like inflation, which gets a lot of play today, oh, 6.2% inflation, that I believe in 15 years, we'll be looking back and thinking of inflation as a historical curiosity because inflation is just purely linked to the currency that you're actually using. And uh, we now have the possibility of tokenization. So the last thing I'll say is many investors say, well, this is complicated, this is risky. I, I, I don't wanna be involved um, and we're not exposed to crypto. So uh, I've got two responses to that. Yes, it is risky. And if you want something risk-free, then you can invest in treasury bills and you know what the yield is on those. So it's a matter of risk and expect a return. And the second thing I say is, well, you think you're not exposed to crypto, but you're wrong because you're exposed in a negative way. Because this space has the potential to disrupt or, or even eliminate many of the companies uh, in your current portfolio. So you need to realize that you've got this negative exposure and maybe uh, think about it a little differently. So uh, there's my book and it's great. Thank you to the conference for um, providing electronic copies for those that attend. So at this point, um, I will stop the sharing and um, take a look at the Q and A. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much, Professor Harvey, for that wonderful exposition, talking about the potential as well as the risks. Let me invite my colleague, Professor Anyan, uh, to see if uh, he has some questions to ask or any comments to make. Yeah, thank you, Sris. You know, personally, I have a lot of questions, but I don't think I have any luxury to ask my own questions because there's so many questions, you know, provided from the audience. So let me first of all, you know, uh, bring one question from uh, my, my colleague, uh, Professor Ben Cole. He has a long question, but let me try to summarize to see, you know, uh, to uh, in my own words. So basically, he's saying that there's a view that you know the reason the traditional banks or traditional intermediaries, you know, charge some fees because they have the cover, the compliance costs 
right? As you know, Professor Harvey, you talked about you know the AML and QYC. Uh, therefore, you know, uh, and also another point he raised is that you know uh, when you talk about opaque, right? For the 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 and not, which the, the the blockchain is not opaque because it's open source and the smart contracts open source. But uh, there's also the people who are using the smart smart contracts to do trading. They, that they could be opaque because there's uh, anonymous, right? For all those warnings, therefore the same person can trade, you know, between himself or herself using uh, his or her own warnings and inflate the transaction. Therefore, you know, without the monitoring, without the safety check, uh, it is true that blockchain smart contract is a faster and cheaper, but it actually is at the sacrifice of this safety check. So. He wants you to. Yeah. Okay, I can I can deal with those two questions. They're yeah. they're completely different questions. So, um, so the one thing, like for the uh, the banks, it's kind of obvious that the savings rates are low and the lending rates are high because you need to pay for that infrastructure. So you need to pay for the brick and mortar. You need to pay for the employees, uh, and you, and you're right. You need to pay for the security. It's enormous what these banks pay for security every year. Uh, it could be over a billion dollars uh, to basically uh, provide security. And this is their own systems also, which uh, often are coded in a language that uh, hasn't been uh, taught uh, at, at universities in a long time called COBOL. It was an old language when I was an undergrad. Uh, millions of lines of this vulnerable code that's out there. Um, they also uh, obviously have a profit motive, right? So um, that's part of it also. And uh, within this new system, you cut all of that out. So you've got people depositing to an algorithm that doesn't have that overhead. And it is completely open source. Now, um, your, the point that you make is a good point that even though it's open source, um, you need to be skilled to figure out if there's a problem with that, uh, that actual open source code. But what happens in this space is something uh, called uh, forking or, or vampirism. And that is that uh, if you look at that code and you see a way for it to be improved, you can just grab the code and improve it and launch your own protocol. Right, so it's, it's instant to do. Can you imagine you're doing some online banking with your commercial bank and you see something that you think would be a good improvement in the online banking interface and then you submit that idea to the bank? Maybe the bank likes the idea. It could take a year or more to get that interface actually changed. In this space, it can happen within hours. Okay, so the 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 speed of the innovation uh, is enormous. So uh, so I do think again these are, are two questions that are kind of related. Um, what we will see more in the future is uh, peer to peer uh, lending and borrowing, and it's got to be much more uh, efficient. I remember when my grandfather died that in his estate he held a mortgage. And that meant that he lent somebody money and he had a mortgage and that person was paying him principal and then interest, uh, you know, every, every month. And, and that was like an undiversified uh, investment. So think of that mortgage in the future as just being a, a non-fungible token. And, and think of putting those tokens together into a product where somebody could invest in a mortgage that actually is not one mortgage, but potentially millions of mortgages around the world. Okay, and, and again, it's completely algorithmic. It means that the mortgage rate would be lower. It means that the, uh, the actual uh, rate of return that you're getting is higher. Uh, is there a room for a centralized institution in this new world? Yes, it's a big mistake to think that this is a binary choice, that it's either 100% centralized or 100% decentralized. So I can imagine space for many firms that are centralized to thrive in this space. And uh, the mortgage example is a good one because 
There needs to be certain checks that are done that cannot be done algorithmically. So there will be a combination of initiatives in this space. And uh, if, if people are saying it's gonna be 100% decentralized, I just don't uh, agree with that. There are so many questions. As I'm yeah, I, I can go through some of the to... questions. So I, I see them right here. So, oh, have I talked to Charlie Munger uh, or, or Jeremy about Bitcoin or crypto? And uh, do you think they'll convert uh, like Diamond? Well, uh, again, uh, there are many successful investors out there that are highly negative on, on things like uh, Bitcoin. And most of the talk is on Bitcoin. So, so Bitcoin, if you think about it, it's not, uh, it's not really the transactional mechanism that the founder Satoshi Nakamoto thought it would be. It's more like a risky store of value. Uh, there's no fundamental tangible value. There's intangible value, intangible value uh, that's important. Uh, this is something that's brand new. Um, you know, I've been, I've been doing these talks since 2014, and many people uh, have been very skeptical. I did this conference, I guess, uh, five years ago where I talked about decentralized finance, and um, they invited me back to give the same talk like five years later. And I put the slide up of um, what I used back then and what I use today, and they regret it, uh, not taking me seriously uh, five years ago. But I do want to emphasize something that's really important. My talk is not about speculating in Bitcoin. So my talk is about uh, improving the financial system that we've actually got uh, here today. So that system has many flaws. Uh, it has served us well, actually, for uh, multiple generations, but the technology exists today to change it and change it in a very positive way. And yes, there will be uh, some risk. Indeed, an earlier presentation today, uh, people talked about illegal transactions and, oh, we don't want to deal uh, with that. And I pointed out something very simple, that uh, this technology you see all the transactions. So everything is open source. Every single transaction is documented in a blockchain, which makes it very unattractive uh, for illegal transactions. Indeed, you wanna do illegal transactions, you deal with something anonymous and that is cash. And most people don't realize that 80% of the value of all US currency is in $100 bills. So I don't have 100 in my wallet. Indeed, even if I did, if I went to pay for something, you often see the sign, $100 bills not accepted here. So, so again, there is illegal activity with cash. There will be illegal activity. Um, and, and I think we just need to balance the benefits and the costs. Um, and, and I think that just to use that argument uh, is a false uh, argument. There's a question about um, what will the world look like in, in 15 years? And this is really what I'm talking about. It will be not recognizable in terms of finance. So I, I, I think that many of the large firms, uh, whether commercial banks, insurance companies, brokers, uh, exchanges will not exist or will be transformed into different companies that have a different business model, uh, much uh, smaller. There's a question about regulation and this is really interesting. And, and I think that it's worth uh, spending just a few minutes on it. The regulators, uh, it's really difficult to figure out what to do. So recently uh, Coinbase, which is a centralized company as I mentioned, dealing in decentralized finance, uh, they were offering a 4% savings rate. So you deposit US dollars, they translate it into a token called USDC, and they guaranteed the conversion dollar for dollar, both ways. And then you deposit that with them and you get a 4% uh, savings rate. And they were served with the Wells Notice. The Wells Notice uh, basically said, this is a security, you can't do this. And uh, it's kind of interesting um, because I'm sure the Coinbase lawyers realized that this was a security because of case law on it. 
and they were basically testing the waters. But uh, anybody can go out today and do the same thing that Coinbase was offering in decentralized finance. So this is called yield farming. And you can get 4%, actually you can get better than 4%. You can get 6%, no problem. Uh, indeed, Coinbase was just going to do that, make the 6% and then pay the customer 4 and keep 2% as a profit. But think about the regulator's problem. How are they going to deal with the decentralized uh, protocol? So with Coinbase, you can actually, uh, it, it's got a CEO, it's got a headquarters, it's got a board of directors. You can actually serve them. But what about the decentralized protocol? Uh, what are you going to do? Who are you going to serve? It's, it's on thousands of computers. Even if you went in the US and turned all of those computers off, there's still thousands of computers around the world that are actually running this. So this is a very special challenge that is being uh, posed by uh, decentralized finance. So again, um, it's a much, uh, it's a, it's a real challenge and there's no regulatory guidance right now. I believe that we do need regulatory guidance um, and, and the regulators just going after the centralized firms that are basically low hanging fruit. Coinbase is in the news, it's big, it IPO'd, so they can go after them. The much more difficult task is uh, to deal with uh, some of these other uh, protocols, which literally are just an algorithm. Not sure what they can do. But the fundamental idea here is that the definition of money has changed. The central banks are scrambling to do a central bank digital currency. And in my opinion, the US will be last. Maybe you can do this in China, where people don't care if the government sees every single transaction you make. But that's not going to be acceptable uh, in the US. But the banks got to do something. Because effectively, they've lost control of the money supply. And indeed, I think they've already lost uh, control, especially in many emerging markets where, forget the local currency, we can just hold US dollar tokens or gold tokens in our wallet. And the central bank in that emerging country doesn't matter. So that's the world that we're headed towards. There are plenty of hurdles. There's gonna be plenty ups and downs. That's obvious, we've seen those already. But I believe that the promise in terms of uh, solving all these problems uh, is enormous. And potentially, uh, this can be a very good thing for our economy. And the last thing I'll say is that there are very few things that economists agree upon. And you know that, it's almost a joke that uh, economists disagree on almost everything. But one thing that they agree upon is that anything that reduces transactions costs is a good thing. And it's a good thing for economic growth. And we need economic growth. Uh, given the debt that the government has taken on, the best way to deal with it is growth. So nobody wants higher taxes. Nobody wants inflation to monetize that debt. But if we have growth, that's a way to pay off that debt, and it's a way to make everybody uh, better off. And this innovation has got that potential. Professor Harvey, that was <laughs> that was an excellent uh, excellent way to summarize your entire talk. I think, uh, in the interest of time, uh, we probably have to stop the questions here. And you know, as you saw, there were many many questions. Uh, perhaps we could not address all of them, but I want to thank, uh, thank you very much for this very enlightening and engaging webinar. Uh, and to our audience, if you enjoyed this event, uh, please join us for our next event on December 7th, which is titled SPACs, the new IPO. Featuring Andrew Cohen, E. Remy Lane, David Penton, and Ekla Via Saraf, discussing the role of SPACs as an increasingly popular alternative to traditional IPOs. Thank you once again for joining us and very special thanks to Professor Harvey.